Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another uh, virtual sh uh, shadowing session with Fresh Dental Shadowing. Today, we have a very special guest all the way from Australia, Dr. Amanda Nguyen. Um, she is another international um, dentist that we will have on our platform, and she is an oral pathologist, and she'll just kind of talk about her day-to-day -day life. And so on to you, Dr. Amanda. Thank you very much. So thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here. So I am... Uh, an oral medicine specialist and I am in Australia. I work in a couple of Australian states. I am mostly based in Perth, which is on the west coast of Australia. And every couple of months I fly up to Darwin, the Northern Territory, which is towards the top of Australia uh, to provide oral medicine services there. So a little bit of a breakdown of what I'll be talking about today. And I'm happy to take questions as well at the end. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about who I am. I'll tell you a little bit about what oral medicine is. Um, I'll give you some take on points to improve your dentistry and oral medicine uh, knowledge. And then we'll go through some cases with time for questions at the end. So I was actually born in Singapore, which is why my accent may be a little bit different. But um, I was born in Singapore and I moved to Australia, to Melbourne, Australia, when I was 15. Uh, I finished off high school in Melbourne and I attended the Melbourne Dental School for five years of dentistry. Uh, at that stage, it was an undergraduate program, so you can do it in five years. Now it has since changed to a postgraduate program. Uh, following... The uh, following my dentistry uh, degree, I joined the Royal Australian Navy, where I worked as a dentist for several years. Um, following discharge from the Navy, um, I worked and decided that I wanted to do a little bit of further study. So I did my membership in general dental practice through the Royal Australasian College of Dental Surgeons. Um, by the stage after I left the Navy, I had moved to Perth, Western Australia, to be with my uh, then boyfriend, now husband. And I currently live in Perth, which is the photograph there on the bottom right. And Perth is a beautiful place. So a little bit of a breakdown about my uh, education. So I did my Bachelor of Dental Science through the University of Melbourne. And then I did my uh, membership at the Royal Australasian College of Dental Surgeons uh, in general dental practice, which is a two-year part-time program that can be done online. Um, although your final examinations are in Sydney in New South Wales in Australia. Um, after that, in 2016, uh, I started my Doctor of Clinical Dentistry at the University of Western Australia. Um, after graduating, I had my uh, Doctor of Clinical Dentistry. I had fellowship of the Austra uh, Oral Medicine Academy of Australasia and also another membership at the Royal Australasian College of Dental Surgeons in Oral Medicine. And I currently work in private, uh, in private practice, in public practice, and I'm a part-time PhD candidate at the University of Western Australia. So this is a little bit about Perth, Western Australia. If you have never seen a quokka before, I do recommend that you get here if you can, um, given the international travel, uh, travel restrictions, maybe one day. The quokka is the world's happiest animal. You can see it always looks like it has a little bit of a smile. Um, Perth, we're famous for our beaches and it's also a vibrant city. So at the University of Western Australia, I work primarily at the uh, Oral Health Centre of Western Australia. Um, as you already know, I'm currently pursuing my PhD. Um, I'm also an adjunct senior lecturer um, in oral medicine at the university and I am a clinician at the oral medicine specialist uh, clinic in public uh, through the public system. So a little bit about what my day-to-day -day life will be. Um, this doesn't all happen in one day, but just uh, a little bit of an idea of some of the things that go on. So um, in any given week, I am either preparing a lecture or lecturing both to the university or outside the university. Um, I am a consultant in oral medicine at the Perth Children's Hospital uh, as part of the oral medicine team there, uh, which is great. Um, you already know that every couple of uh, months I go to Darwin, and that's my Darwin uh, location there on the left-hand side. I work in private practice in Perth, Western Australia. Um, I, I actually work in a group practice in oral medicine, and you can see all five of us there at the middle bottom. Um, and it's a great practice. I, I do like working there. And I think having the support um, and camaraderie of fellow oral medicine specialists really makes discussing cases very interesting. So that's one of the advantages of working in a group practice, which I like. Um, I'm also part of the uh, executive team at the Australian Dental Association in Western Australia. And we have, uh, every, we have meetings 
every second week at least, uh, often more. So that's the group of us there in Christmas jumpers at the front of our newsletter for Christmas. Um, just so you know, uh, Christmas in Australia is blistering hot. Uh, we put on the Christmas jumpers for a fun photograph and then we took them off really quickly. Um, <laughs> just so you know, you know, it's, it's at least 35 degrees Celsius. Um, and that's a bird's eye view there of the Oral, uh, Oral Health Centre of Western Australia, which um, between the Perth Children's Hospital and the Oral Health Centre of Western Australia, that forms the bulk of my public practice. Um, on the left hand side there, you can see that I took a little photograph uh, off Canva of somebody typing. Um, on any given day, a lot of my time will also be spent on preparing correspondence uh, from patients that I've seen to send letters back to referrers or to on refer patients. All right, uh, this is just a really quick uh, view of some of the things that I'm involved with. Um, I put this up not necessarily uh, to tell you everything that I'm involved in, but very frequently I get questions from people about certain aspects of things that I do. Um, if anybody's interested in the college, for example, or in the sleep association or in the oral medicine academies, um, you're more than welcome to contact me for questions uh, about this separately or at the end if you want, if we've got time. All right, so oral medicine. Now, it is a three-year full-time degree uh, in Australia. Um, in some countries, like, for example, New Zealand, and in the past, the UK, you would need both a medicine, uh, a medical and dental degree. Uh, however, that's, uh, that's since changed in the UK and Australia. Um, I had a couple of questions about why I decided to become a specialist or from people that are interested in being specialists, and I could talk on that all day, but I actually ended up filming a video on YouTube about this very topic because I had a lot of people ask me questions. So there's a QR code there. So throughout my presentation, I will actually have QR codes come up frequently because uh, there's too much to cover uh, in a presentation. So if you are interested, you can scan the QR code um, and that will bring you to, to, the, to the link. Uh, if you're not sure on how to use a QR code, you can just... Um, open up your camera. You don't have to take a photograph of it, but if you put your camera on your phone over that, the, the link will pop up the top. All right, so the meaty bit, what exactly is oral medicine? Now, oral medicine is a specialist branch of dentistry that's concerned with the diagnosis, prevention, and predominantly non-surgical management of medically related disorders and conditions affecting the oral and maxillofacial region. So the things we see include oral mucosal disease, oral facial pain conditions, and we also sometimes have input into the oral health care of medically complex patients. Um, in Australasia, there is the Oral Medicine Academy, and most regions or uh, countries will also have their own society or, or academy, and I've got uh, some of the information there right at the end. So this is Australian, and it is worthwhile noting that it will be different um, in the USA. Um, and the girls here have told me that most of the people listening in um, will, will be from the US. So just take this uh, with the knowledge that, 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 that is different from where you are. But in Australia uh, and in most places, oral medicine is actually different from oral pathology. And there's often a lot of confusion between the two. Um, oral medicine uh, in most places is a clinical degree, so we see a lot of patients. Um, oral pathologists, where I'm from, uh, are people who are concerned with the diagnosis of these conditions, so they may not necessarily see patients and they may interpret investigations such as histopathology. Now, there is an entity called clinical oral pathology, uh, which can sometimes be confused with oral medicine, but I'll just tell you about oral medicine from my perspective. Now, in the USA, um, Oral medicine and oral facial pain were recently recognized as separate specialties. Uh, so you may have oral facial pain specialists and you may have oral medicine specialists, uh, but, in, but oral medicine specialists also see oral facial pain conditions. So I understand how it can be very confusing, but there's just a, a brief breakdown of, of the different specialties. Now, obviously with some cases, there will be a lot of overlap, but I'll just tell you what I know from my perspective. All right, so what are some of the things that we see? Um, oral mucosal lesions, uh, something that form quite a, a bulk of our practice. So it would be things like oral ulcers, oral cancers, uh, precancerous lesions. For oral manifestation of systemic conditions, um, it can be things like, for example, oral ulceration, uh, secondary to gastrointestinal conditions or to, and other immune, uh, other immune issues. 
uh, you already know about oral cancer and precancer, and I've got a couple of cases there that we'll talk about. We see oral facial pain and headaches. So temporal mandibular joint disorders also form a bulk of my practice. Um, taste changes, oral burning, oral dysesthesia, halitosis, salivary gland disorders like hyperfunction or hyperfunction or Strogan syndrome, for example. Uh, medically complex patients, sometimes we are asked to give a opinion on their management. And I also see patients uh, for dental sleep medicine, so I can provide oral appliances on the uh, advice of a sleep physician. So the list goes on, but the scope of oral medicine is actually uh, quite broad. So oral medicine is very much a clinical specialty uh, as opposed to oral pathology. So I see patients and I do perform um, many procedures and I organize uh, investigations for patients that work towards their diagnosis, for example, uh, biopsies or blood tests or uh, radiographic imaging. Um, I do take care of my patients from diagnosis to management. And also in many of these cases, so for example, if a patient has oral lichen planus or a oral potentially malignant disorder, a long-term follow-up is required. And I do see my patients long-term for that. There are many multidisciplinary cases. So I work hand in hand with a lot of uh, great colleagues um, in Australia and worldwide. For example, for oral medicine, I personally perform uh, soft tissue uh, biopsies. So I can do incisional and excisional biopsies. But if there's anything that involves um, bone pathology, for example, cysts in the jawbone or trauma or cancer reconstruction or anything like that, I will refer on to um, my oral maxillofacial surgery colleagues. Sometimes if a patient has lichen planus and there are skin manifestations as well as oral manifestations, I work with dermatology or immunology. Um, if the patient has oral ulcerations as a result of a gastrointestinal disorder, then I work with a gastroenterologist. Uh, so the list goes on, but e oral medicine, I suppose, in essence, is really the interface between medicine and dentistry, which is part of what makes it so interesting. So here I've got some photographs and you can see that there's a patient with a white patch under his tongue. We're standing at the photograph on the left there. He's got a, a white patch on his tongue and I performed an incisional biopsy um, and sent it off for histopathological evaluation. The photograph in the middle there, you can see that the patient had a lump on his tongue. Actually, this was her tongue, a lump on her tongue. Uh, and I performed an excisional biopsy and sent it off for histo histopathology. And um, that was a lipoma. And the photograph there on the right-hand side uh, is a patient with a mucus seal on the lower lip, which I excised and again sent off for histopathological evaluation. So as part of an oral medicine specialist, uh, I do work very closely with medical and oral pathologists, and I work closely with the team at Clinipath Pathology. Um, I, I send my samples to them for evaluation, um, and they have medical pathologists and, and oral pathologists on board as well. So they work together to give um, me a report. Now, I've already mentioned that I do see oral facial pain patients and temporal mandibular joint disorders. So you can see the photographs there on the bottom, some of the different splints that I can recommend for patients, um, as well as my drawing of a temporal mandibular joint. All right, so now we'll spend a little bit of time on oral cancer and precancer. Um, the important part, the important point, I suppose, that I would like to make when we are talking about oral cancer is that it's actually really important to define where we're talking about. Um, throughout time, the term oral cancer has been used in the literature to mean a variety of things, and that can make interpretation uh, of epidemiology, for example, or just for the simple fact that sometimes we're not talking about the same thing. So oral cancer, strictly, we're talking about oral cavity. So it will be tongue, floor of mouth, the retromolar trigone, buccal mucosa, gingiva. Base of tongue and oral pharynx is technically, uh, should be known as oral pharyngeal cancer rather than oral cavity cancer or oral cancer. So I think it's, I think it's good to, to break it up to, to make it easier to interpret studies. Um, lip is sometimes considered part of oral cancer, but again, I think it should be considered separately because the etiology and management of lip cancer and oral pharyngeal cancer is actually very different from the oral cavity proper. So here you've got my photographs, again, starting from left to right. Uh, we've got a patient there with persistent crusting involving the lower lip. Now the diagnosis, the clinical diagnosis of, the, of this is consistent with actinic colitis, which is very common in Australia and is usually a result of long-term sun damage. Um, the photograph in the middle, this is actually a patient with, um, with hyperplastic candidosis. 
Now, with uh, chronic hypoplastic candidosis such as this, a biopsy is required because they are frequently dysplastic or potentially malignant on biopsy. Uh, my patient there on the very right-hand side uh, has a squamous cell carcinoma of the lateral tongue. So we've already talked a little bit about how it is important to, to define the site of oral cancer, whether it's oral cavity, lip, or oral pharyngeal. Now, the other thing to know about oral cancer is that when people say oral cancer, most times they mean oral cavity squamous cell carcinoma because it is the most common. A squamous cell means that it's coming from the epithelium of the oral cavity, which is the lining surface of the oral cavity. However, it is important to note that oral cancer doesn't only cover oral squamous cell carcinoma. If you mean OSCC, you should define that because there are other cancers that can appear in the mouth as well. So some of the things include, for example, salivary gland tumor, tumors, uh, lymphoma, odontogenic tumors, you can have metastases of other cancers in the body, you can have sarcomas and melanomas. So here are some of my photographs uh, on the very left hand side, that is a squamous cell carcinoma involving the ventral tongue. The uh, imaging in the middle there, where the radiologist has actually put the little orange circle for me. This was a patient that was referred um, in for pain involving his premolar region. There was nothing wrong with the tooth, so the dentist referred him in. Um, his symptoms were a little bit atypical, so I sent him off for an MRI and CT of the area. And where the green circle is, that is actually a prostate cancer metastasis. The patient has a medical history of prostate cancer and it had unfortunately metastasized to the oral cavity, which can happen happen. Um, I think it is important when we are taking medical histories for patients, we actually spend a bit of time on their previous cancer history. Um, the most common cancers to metastasize for women are breast cancers. The most common cancers to metastasize for men are prostate cancers. The next uh, photograph there on the right, that's a multiple myeloma. And sometimes when you see a lump on the gum, there's a little bit of a tendency to dismiss it as only an abscess or nothing too much to worry about. But um, I think the overarching theme of uh, a portion of this presentation would be if it's in, uh, if you're in doubt to, to please check it out. Now the photograph there on the extreme right, that is a lovely female who was a dentalist. So she wears full upper dentures and she never felt, uh, and she never saw a dentist because after she had her denture uh, taken in, she felt she didn't have to go for checkups or anything like that. She only presented to oral medicine when she started to feel like her dentures wouldn't fit very well anymore. And you can actually see that there's a, a lump or a swelling up there in the maxillary buc buccal sulcus. Now, this was a firm lump that was impinging on her full upper denture and it was making it difficult for her to bite down. It wouldn't fit properly anymore. And I biopsied this and the result came back as lymphoma. Now, the photograph there on the bottom, uh, this is from a patient of mine who chews beetle quid, which is something that you might see in... Uh, in certain populations more frequently, um, that predisposes the patient to a condition that's um, that's known as oral submucous fibrosis, and that is also, also considered potentially premalignant. All right, so a little bit of a quiz, and I'll give you a couple of seconds here to look at these photographs. Now, my question to you is, which of the following is oral squamous cell carcinoma? Now, my point from this slide is not necessarily wanting you to actually diagnose oral squamous cell carcinoma based on looking at the photographs, but it's to actually make the point that it is very difficult to tell. Now, I am a firm believer is that in that there's no such thing as a silly referral, because honestly, any of these could have been. Now, uh, on the lower lip there, again, starting from the left, uh, up the top there, that was an area of dysplasia. Now, if you look at the left on the bottom there on the lateral tongue, that was frictional keratosis. Again, dysplasia there on the floor of mouth in the photograph in the center. Now on the right-hand side up the top, that was the oral squamous cell carcinoma. And the one below was an area of frictional keratosis from um, trauma from the patient biting themselves. So the uh, main point there, if in doubt, check it out and don't feel bad or don't feel that there is a silly referral. Because sometimes people ask me like, oh, I feel bad referring something in case it's nothing. But my answer is, what if it is something? So... I think it's worthwhile. All right, so a little bit of uh, tips about how to actually not miss a oral potentially 
uh, a, a oral potentially pre-malignant condition or oral cancer. It all starts with screening and examination and, and the role that dentists plays uh, is paramount because there's no one else that looks in a patient's oral cavity as often as a dentist. So it's important to actually do it in a systematic manner. Um, it doesn't matter which order you do it in, but if you do it in the same order every time, you're much less likely to miss things. So it's important to have a structured uh, way in your mind about how you will cover all of the oral cavity um, I like to do it at the start of my appointment because then I've got fresh eyes. I do it in a systematic manner. Um, I, it is good to be aware of the commonly missed areas, which I'll cover in a uh, one of the following slides. Now, if you have dental loops, um, you can put them on. Uh, you can see my loops there on the photograph on the right-hand side. And it's also important to use white light where possible. Now, I personally have a, a headlight that's white light that I put up over the top, and I use that when I'm uh, examining patients occasionally. All right, now this is my general setup for examining patients. Now I use two mouth mirrors. I find that it's a lot easier to stretch out the uh, oral mucosa when you're using two mirrors. It's easier to depress the tongue. You can actually reflect and look at the uh, lingual cavity or the lingual areas. And you, know, you can use that for uh, examining the heart palate or with direct vision. So I find using two mirrors actually very handy. I always have a piece of gauze. Now the piece of gauze is when I get my patients to stick out their tongue, I grab the tip of it with a little bit of gauze gently and I move it from uh, left to right to actually look at the posterior tongue. Uh, occasionally I do use uh, ice cream sticks there, which are the two wooden sticks there. I don't use the, the ice cream sticks for every patient, but they can be useful, for example, if you need a little bit more depression of the tongue, or if you want to check the patient's temporal mandibular uh, joints, you can get them to bite on these ice cream sticks as well to see if you can replicate pain. All right, so the uh, principles of a good intraoral examination. Um, uh, there is a short YouTube video that I filmed uh, for a fundraiser, and that is on my YouTube. Uh, you're more than welcome to uh, check that out if you want. But this is the graphic here that I've prepared um, on how to do a good intraoral examination. So first off, it starts extra orally, which I'll cover. But when you are looking at patients, it's important to look at their lip vermilion, which is the bit where ladies or people put lip liner on. It's the, the border between your uh, labial mucosa and skin. Now, if there's loss of vermilion border, that could be a sign of actinic colitis or chronic sun damage. Very common in Australia, as you know, because we're quite sunny here. Um, but it's important to look at the lip vermilion and vermilion border, not to miss any lip cancers or anything like that. Um, it's a once, sorry, the general principles of your examination as well is that if you uh, are visually inspecting something, you should be palpating the structures as well. So I always encourage people when they flip the lip, both top and bottom, to actually have a gentle feel of the lips as well in case there are any lumps or bumps in there. Um, mucoseals of the lower lip are fairly common. Sometimes you can get minor salivary gland neoplasms. Uh, anywhere there is a minor salivary gland. Um, you can see there I'm using my two mouth mirrors to have a good look at the left and right buccal mucosa. Um, it's important not to forget the buccal sulcus, so to actually get the mirror in there, look all the way down to the bottom, look at the retromolar areas and look at all of the gums as well. Now, subtle swellings of the heart palate can sometimes be missed. Um, what I do after I visually inspect the heart palate is that I actually put my index finger um, in my patient's mouth with the glove on, obviously, and then I just run it over the top there to see if there are uh, any swellings, because sometimes they may not be uh, readily appreciable until you actually uh, have a good feel. Now, when you're looking at the patient's tongue, it's important to look at all surfaces of the tongue, uh, dorsal, lateral, ventral, as far back as the posterior aspects. Now, you may notice that when you first start looking at the patient's uh, bilateral, lateral tongue, that you may notice certain structures at the end. Um, there is uh, there is normal anatomy up the back, like your lymphoid tissue and your um, circumvallate papilla, your, your, your filiform pap papilla, uh, in that area. So if you're in doubt as to what you're looking, whether it's a normal anatomy or not in that region, have a good look at the other side. So get this patient to stick out their tongue and bring it to the other side and have a look and see if it's normal or not. Yeah, you can also look at a textbook and look at photographs to see if that's normal, but it can look unusual. And sometimes patients can be a bit worried when they find those areas because it's been like that for, the, for their entire life, but they only just noticed it. Um, you can visualize the base of tongue by using a uh, mirror reflection as well. Now, when you're examining the tongue, it's important that you actually note that, uh, that the patient has no weakness of the tongue so they can stick it out and they can move it from side to side and it's equal strength. 
Now, when looking at the floor of mouth, it's actually a good idea to dry the floor of mouth. Patients don't like use of a triplex, which is the air spray to dry the floor of mouth much. Um, it doesn't feel very comfortable. So I actually dry it with that piece of gauze to have a good look at the floor of mouth. Now, floor of mouth and tongue are high risk sites of oral squamous cell carcinoma. So it's a, a have, have a really good look. If the floor of mouth is wet, it's difficult to see properly, which is why uh, we recommend drying it, with, drying it first before looking. I'm um, looking at the oral pharynx, so you must look at the soft, uh, the soft palate, the uvula, tonsils, and tonsillar pillars. Now, if you're doing the oropharyngeal examination, sometimes a lot of patients ask me, what do you do if a patient has a bad gag reflex? Um, the short answer is that you really just apologize to the patient and perform the examination to the best of your ability. Patients are understanding. They do understand why you need to have a good look down the back of their throat. And most of the time, um, they, they can work with you to achieve that. Um, now, we've already talked about palpating and visually inspecting, but it's also important that you palpate the floor of mouth. You can actually do bimanual pal uh, palpation of the uh, saliva glands, so you see if you can get anything good saliva flow out of the major ducts. Excuse me, I do have a little bit of hay fever in the morning, so um, excuse my voice. All right, so... The other thing as part of your extra oral examination, we've already covered looking at the lips. Now it's important to pay attention to the patient's overall health as they first present to the clinic, the way they talk, the way, the way they walk and the way they speak will all give you the color of their skin, for example, are they jaundiced or not, will all give you ideas as to their general overall health. Um, when you're examining the neck, it's a good idea to revise your anatomy to know where the lymph nodes actually are. Um, I find it easier to divide the neck into the relevant structures. So the anterior and posterior triangles, for example, which is bordered by the sternocleidomastoid mastoid muscle to actually know what structures you're palpating and what you're feeling for. Um, lymphadenopathy um, is where uh, it's something that you don't want to miss. So you want to know whether the lymph nodes are painful to palpate. You want to know whether they are enlarged to palpation. You want to know whether they are fixed or whether they've got decreased mobility or fixation to adjacent structures or not. So all of that I think is quite uh, important and I have covered a little bit of that in my uh, separate uh, video there. All right, so this was a patient of mine. Uh, if you have a look at his photographs, can you notice anything? I think it's a little bit of a giveaway there because um, I've included the photograph of his neck, but he actually had a lymphadenopathy of the neck. And you can see that when he sticks his tongue out, it actually deviates to one side. So it's not a straight, smooth uh, path for his tongue to, to stick out. Um, and he unfortunately had um, oral pharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma. But these were the, the subtle signs that, that could be picked up intro, uh, that could be picked up on his examination. All right, now as part of the extra oral examination, we've already talked about some of the other things, knowing the neck and stuff like that. Paying attention to the patient's skin, really important. Um, here I've got a few patients, uh, again, as you know, uh, lip cancers or actinic colitis, lip squamous cell carcinomas are very common in Australia because the amount of sun that we have, um, you can also get squamous cell carcinoma of the, sin, of the skin. So I've got a patient, I've got two patients here with a skin squamous cell carcinoma of their ear. One was being treated, the other one was about to start treatment. Sometimes it can give you a clue to their overall health. I've got another patient there, you can see these little, uh, these little, um, pin pit pricks little papura and telangiotesias of his ear. And he had a condition that's called hereditary hemorrhagic telangiotesia. You could actually see it on his tongue as well. And he was complaining of frequent nosebleeds. So I thought that was a, a really nice one because you can see this extra orally. Another patient there on the uh, right-hand side or a photograph of her knee, she had skin lichen planus and she also had oral lichen planus, which is why she was seeing me. And there at the bottom there, uh, a patient with lip squamous cell carcinoma that was operated on by a plastic surgeon. And, and as you can see there on the right-hand side, uh, he had a really good result from that. Now, the two-week rule is important. So for those who haven't heard of it, the two-week rule is a commonly used rule when a dentist uh, performs a dental examination and finds something in the mouth. Now, they are not sure what it is, and they're not sure the patient will need a referral. So the two-week rule is where if you find, for example, a white patch involving the patient's a tongue, but you can see that there is a sharp tooth next to it, a lost filling or something like that, you need to eliminate the source of the possible trauma. So in this case, you would polish down the tooth, bring the patient back in two weeks and see whether the white patch resolves or not. 
Now, if it has resolved, then it was most likely uh, in relation to the sharp tooth, and you can reassure the patient and keep an eye on it yourself. Now, if it's still there after two weeks, then that's when you know um, that it needs to be checked out. But the important part about the two-week rule is to make sure that you have systems and recalls in place so that you don't forget to check back in two weeks. So here I've got a photograph. You've seen this photograph already. Uh, you know it's an oral squamous cell carcinoma. Um, she had a ulcer, persistent ulcer involving her ventral tongue. Now, for various reasons, she was lost to follow up and couldn't come back in for a while. Um, but you can see that in the couple of weeks there that it took to get her back into the clinic, um, there was significant evolution of the lesion. So that's why it's important to check back in two weeks because some pathologies can be aggressive. All right, so now I'll move on to a couple of cases. Now, these aren't really uh, the full cases because I think uh, just, just for reasons of time, it's not possible to cover this in, in full detail, but I think it should illustrate some of the points or at least show you that oral medicine is very interesting. So this patient is Josh, who's a 15-year-old boy at the time. Now, his medical history was that he was born with branchoautorenal syndrome. Now, he had a live donor transplant of his kidney from his maternal grandfather shortly after he was born. Um, and then, unfortunately, he had chronic rejection of that kidney, and he had to have peritoneal dialysis and eventually hemodialysis. And then he had a second renal transplant from a cadaver um, in 2017. Now, he was referred to me uh, by my orthodontic colleague for an ulcer involving his buccal mucosa. He had presented to orthodontics because he was wanting braces, and I think um, it would just so happen that the time was coincident that he had the ulcer and it was referred in. Now, this is an ulcer involving the left buccal mucosa. It was about 1.3 centimeters. It was very deep, uh, and it was indurated to touch, which means that it was uh, firm and hard to touch, and it was very painful. <coughs> Now, when I next, uh, when I saw him, so that, that photograph was from the referral. Now, when I saw him two weeks uh, later, it was difficult to get him into the oral medicine clinic because he was actually hospitalized because the ulcers were causing him pain. He was unable to eat or drink. Now, I went to uh, pay him a ward visit. And when I saw him at that stage, the ulcer there on the left buccal mucosa, that's the photograph that's, uh, that's on the right-hand side, has actually evolved. And you can actually see the rolled margins there, and you can see how deep it is. There was also another ulcer involving his right buccal mucosa. Now, these ulcers were causing him uh, significant uh, pain, and he was on pain relief for this as well. And understandably, uh, him and mum were quite distressed. So looking at the photographs there, what are some of the different differential diagnoses that you would think uh, for Josh's ulcers? Now, the appearance of the ulcers could be uh, of a deep fungal etiology. It could be traumatic because it's bilateral. So he could be biting himself really badly and it's not healing. It could be medication related because medications have, a, have an extensive list of adverse effects. So it could be medication related. It could be neutropenic because we already know that he has an involved medical history. Now, people that have a uh, transplant, sometimes they are more prone to developing uh, certain viral infections like CMV, EBV. Um, he could have post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder, which is important to rule out. It could be cancer, even though it was bilateral. I mean, the appearance of a, um, of a deep ulcer with the indurated margins is cause for concern. Um, syphilis is on the rise in Australia and worldwide, and it could be something unusual, even like tuberculosis, given that he is immunocompromised, given that he is a, a post-transplant patient. Now, this is a little bit of a list on the medications that he's on. He also had several medica uh, medical medication changes during that time because I think his treating physicians were concerned that maybe it may be related to his medications. Now, you can see there that with the change of medications, medication-related adverse effects are actually really tricky to diagnose because sometimes patients may have these adverse effects years after they've started the medication. Now, it may go away when they cease the medication or it may persist and there's no sort of set timeline as to where, when symptoms will definitely um, resolve. If it was related to the medication, you stop it. So sometimes it can be very tricky to actually establish a temporal relationship and come up with that diagnosis. But as you can see there, uh, it was attempted and he had several uh, medication changes by his treating physicians. 
This is a copy of his blood test results. Um, I've highlighted the relevant one there where his neutrophils were actually really low. So he was neutropenic at the start. Now, this was corrected with giving him a filgastrum. And then you can see there on 20th of March, um, his neutrophil level started to come back up. He also had extensive testing through the hospital department and the uh, various people that he was seeing. Um, he had, you know, tests for the different viruses, like I mentioned. Um, he had urine microscopy and cultures. He had blood tests. Um, he had blood PCRs to see if there were viruses. And the ones that I've highlighted in yellow, he had them repeated uh, several times. Um, he had a test for fungal, for viral, for bacteria. He's had a CT scan of his chest and sinuses, which were unremarkable. Um, he had a PET scan of the area as well. And um, he was even tested by a department for micronutrient deficiencies, and they requested zinc, vitamin A, B1, and C. So you can see here that he had extensive investigation to try to find the cause of these oral ulcers. He also had several biopsies. Now, not all of this was related to the ulcers, but um, you know, it, um, it was decided that he did need this by his treating team. So the buccal mucosa ulcers were biopsied and it came back as chronic ulcers of unknown cause. Now that can happen sometimes either because there is an unknown cause to the area or maybe it was a traumatic ulcer. That's what the result is that it will come back. Um, he had bone marrow biopsies as well to exclude the lymphoproliferative condition. He's had um, cultures done of his bone marrow as well. He had a renal biopsy to investigate possible graft rejection. And then he had a biopsy uh, of, of his liver as well. And they all basically came back um, unremarkable. So what do you think the diagnosis of his ulcers is uh, given the results of all of the tests that he's had? Well, if you don't know, that's fine, because to be honest, establishing the cause of his ulcers was very difficult, and we've never been able to definitively do so. Um, the good news is that his buccal, uh, his buccal mucosa ulcers healed up, and he's fine. I still see him for follow-up nowadays, and um, he's, he's, he's doing great, and they haven't really come back. Um, it could be related to his neutropenia. It could be related to one of the medications. It could even possibly be uh, an infection that just wasn't picked up. But the important point is, uh, he is getting better. And the other point that I did want to make is that ulcers can be very difficult. So sometimes if you see a photograph of an ulcer, there's a tendency for, uh, for people to think that ulcers are easy or that you can diagnose them off a photograph, but uh, ulcers are really, can be, can be extremely complicated. So here, um, to help with that process a little bit, I prepared a document, which was a flow chart, because I like flow charts. I, I, I work better with flow charts as well. This is a flow chart on a, an approach to oral ulceration. Now, I've broken it down. I think the most important points when you are thinking about an ulcer is where, what is the process by which the ulcer has formed? Because that will give you a clue as to its etiology and also how long it has persisted. When I say think about how the ulcer has formed, um, you can think about whether there's trauma to the area that's disrupting the overlying epithelium. You can ask the patient whether it started off as little vesicles of bully, which are fluid filled, and then they've popped over time. Um, you can have a look and see if the rest of the oral mucosa, for example, is red or they've got other symptoms like burning or pain, and it could be due to a dis uh, disturbance of proliferation and differentiation. So they may not have enough factors to actually make their mucosa turnover properly. They may be anemic, for example, uh, or, or it could be a malignant process. Now, again, not expecting everyone to know that, but Oral ulcers can be an oral manifestation of a systemic condition, and the list of this is extensive. Uh, oral medicine specialists uh, are trained with knowledge in a lot of these conditions, so we can uh, think about uh, diagnosing patients properly. Now, with the flowchart there that I've given you the uh, QR code for, it is important to note medical history as well. Now, if the patient is immunocompromised like Josh was, um, that is really important to know because all of the uh, all of the flowchart really starts to go out the window a little bit and you need to be, uh, it becomes more complicated. The other thing that's important to know is whether the patient has been unwell or not. Sometimes that may point to a viral etiology and the patient has been unwell or acutely unwell. So it's so important to get them the medical care that they need. Two weeks is the point there where I started to break down my flow chart into acute and uh, acute versus persistent ulcers. The reason why two weeks is the uh, is, is the number that is used is because we want to allow uh, for mucosal turnover time, which is generally about seven to 10 days, but two weeks just to be safe. 
All right, so a next case uh, was Mrs. G. She was referred for jaw pain. Now her medical history was significant for hypertension, osteoporosis, and hyperlipidemia. And she takes something for hypertension. And she's also on prolia injections, also known as demusumab. Uh, no history of cancer, no previous radiotherapy. We couldn't really get uh, adequate information on why she was on prolia, how long she was on prolia for, how many doses she had. Now, you can, when you look into her mouth, you can see an area of exposed bone on the mandible, and it was starting to cause her soreness. So based on her history and her oral and her presentation, uh, what do you think her diagnosis is? Now, if you're thinking that it could be medication related to osteonecrosis of the jaw, um, you are right. And that is something that, that I feel like I'm seeing more and more often. If you are interested in finding out about medication-related osteonecrosis of the jaw, um, there is a QR code there to a publication that I co-wrote with the oral maxillofacial surgeon, uh, Mr. Leon Smith in Perth. And there's some nice photographs in there, a little bit of explanation about the condition if you want to read more about it. But I think this is a really important one for dentists to know because medication uh, medication related osteonecrosis of the jaw can happen spontaneously, can happen from an ill-fitting denture, can also happen, for example, if you take out a tooth uh, in a medically compromised patient. Now, when we looked at the medications implicated in medication related osteonecrosis of the jaw, now if you've been a dentist for a while, or if you are going through dental school, for example, the most common medications include bisphosphonates and dimusumab. Um, however, there are many more that we're starting to realize are actually affected. Now, this is a paper that I did with um, my colleagues uh, over East, uh, Dr. Leantio, Geraldine Moses, and Professor McCullough, uh, when we looked at the Australian databases to actually find out which were the most common drugs implicated. Um, if you're interested, you can uh, read, read up that paper. But there is a table here that I've summarized from another paper, King et al. Um, worldwide, where, where they did this um, where, where they published a paper basically on the medications. I'm not going to go through all of them because it's too much, but I think you can always pause the video and have a look. But there are many more medications than the ones that we traditionally know about. And it is also important um, to think about polypharmacy. So if a patient is on one or several of these medications, that obviously increases their risk. And, and this highlights why it's so important for dentists to actually do a thorough medical history review to make sure that the patient that you're treating is fit and healthy enough, or if there are any risk uh, before a procedure, you, you discuss uh, with them and obtain informed consent. All right, case three. So this was a 24-year-old male who had an ulcer under his tongue for one month. Uh, never smoker, no alcohol consumption. You can see there on the bottom right photograph, the ulcer there involving his, um, his lateral tongue. Now, if you look at the photograph up the top there, you may notice some subtle white stray involving his bilateral tongue. Now, the ulcer on his tongue was biopsied uh, by a colleague of mine, and it did come back as oral squamous cell carcinoma. Here you can see his imaging where the radiologist has put the uh, green arrows there on the enhancing lesion, and also a green arrow there involving his involved lymph node. He also had oral lichen planus of, of his mouth. Now, there is a little bit of um, discussion in the literature about whether oral lichen planus is a oral potentially malignant uh, condition or not. According to the World Health Organization, it is. So we do, I, I follow up my oral lichen planus patients um, and I have a discussion with them about risk and risk factor management. So oral lichen planus is one of the oral mucosal conditions that I see. Um, they, we also see patients for vesicular bullous conditions, including mucous membrane pemphigo, sometimes pervigus vulgaris, but out of those, uh, the ones that I do see the most commonly are oral lichen planus patients. Now, the next case, uh, this was a 17-year-old female who was referred in for oral facial pain in the head and neck region. Her medical history was that she uh, was taking metformin for type 2 diabetes or also an oral contraceptive pill. Uh, she was under investigation for pelvic pain uh, during her uh, consultation to she disclosed that there was a history of sexual abuse when she was 13 years old. Now, this is the point that I wanted to make with this case was that traditionally in the past, temporary mandibular joint disorders or facial pain conditions or pain conditions, chronic pain conditions in general, were treated fairly mechanic uh, mechanic mechanically, mechanistically, 
mechanically. So it will be things like, for example, if a patient has temporomandibular joint disorder, you may want to do an occlusal adjustment to bring their bite back into, into space, uh, into place and things like that. However, the literature has really started to show that it is more complex than that. Oral facial pain patients should be treated via a biopsychosocial model of pain. So what that means is that you need to take into account um, psychosocial factors that may be perpetuating the, the patient's pain. So a large part of my consultation is actually spending time with patients finding out you know what has happened in the past if there are any active or previous stresses in their life and the literature has really shown that there are several factors like for example a history of physical and sexual abuse in the past domestic violence uh, things like that that can actually make it more likely that the patient may develop an oral facial pain condition in the future um, this is a screenshot here of the International Association for the Study of Pain, fantastic organization. Um, I did a webinar last year for them on whether we can prevent oral facial pain or not, and I did it with two other excellent presenters. Um, I would recommend that if you can to watch this. Uh, it was Dr. Tara Renton and Dr. Olga, and Dr. Tara Renton is from King's College and Dr. Olga is from the US. So this is um, something that I would recommend that you watch if this is a topic that, that catches your interest. I've already touched on a little bit about psychosocial considerations. If you're more of a reader rather than watching a video, and this is a QR code to a paper that I co-wrote on what you should consider when treating temporary mandibular joint disorders. All right, case five. Now, this I this wasn't really a, a case in the sense of uh, presenting like a patient's history and things like that, but this is a patient that presents to you with oral burning. Now, when we think oral burning, it's really easy to think about burning mouth syndrome because it's the name, right? Oral burning, burning mouth syndrome. However, oral burning is actually a lot more complex than that. Um, or burning mouth syndrome, or we, I, I prefer to call it oral dysesthesia. The reason for that is that patients with oral dysesthesia. So oral dysesthesia, if there's unusual sensations in the mouth, because we know burning mouth syndrome, patients can have oral burning, but sometimes their presenting complaint will be something like a, a bad taste in their mouth or a um, or a, a feeling of swelling of their tongue. Now, sometimes if the, the word burning mouth syndrome just doesn't quite encapsulate that adequately. And the other thing is that burning mouth syndrome isn't really a syndrome. All right. But anyway, so burning mouth syndrome or oral dysesthesia, um, that is a diagnosis of exclusion. So that means that we need to rule out other reasons for oral burning before we can reach that diagnosis. And that is a, uh, there are many reasons why patients may have oral burning. I've listed some of them there. Um, and I think it's just important to have to have the understanding that not all cases of oral burning is burning mouth syndrome. Uh, if you look at the diagnostic criteria, including the international classification for oral facial pain, and um, they do still call it burning mouth syndrome, which is why usually when I discuss this with my patients or talk to them, I give them both names so they understand um, uh, the, the subtleties of that. Uh, burning mouth syndrome was something that uh, I... Uh, I, I did some research on it and I found it quite interesting. Now, there are certain illusions that can actually reduce pain. Now, something that you may have heard of, for example, if someone has lost a limb, uh, so if they've had an amputation of their arm or their leg and they start to get a lot of pain in the area, mirror therapy is actually something that can help. So for example, you use a mirror and you provide patient visual confirmation that they that they still have two legs. So you reflect by a mirror one leg over to the other side that can actually reduce pain parameters. Um, I worked with a, a group there uh, led by Tasha Stanton and she had a lot of really interesting work on how illusions can reduce pain in several conditions. Another one that I think she did was patients with knee osteoarthritis and they sort of had an illusion so that they would make the knee um, smaller or bigger and they would see if that would change the conditions. So then we had a thought to actually do it in patients with burning mouth. So what we did, uh, and this was published in the uh, Journal, Journal of Oral Pathology and Medicine, and we had the, uh, a photograph there of, uh, of, <laughs> of one of our investigators there on the cover. So what we actually did was that we had the patients uh, look at a monitor and we showed them their tongue at baseline. We also had a color inverted condition where we would polarize the image because sometimes with burning mouth patients, our assumption was that they would feel that the tongue was bigger and redder than it really than it really was. Like it would feel larger and when they looked at it, it would look redder. So we had a color inverted condition where we actually polarized the image and turned it blue. We also had a shrink condition where we make the tongue appear smaller to the patient when they were looking in the mirror. And obviously we had controls there. So we've had 
a congruent and incongruent movement. So congruent movement is that what you are doing is what you see on the screen. Incongruent movement was when we would slow the video slightly. So when the patient moved the tongue, uh, it would be delayed. And the theory behind the incongruent movement was that it would break the illusion. So the patients will start to realize that they're just watching a video rather than feeling that it is their own actual tongue. So um, in this pilot study here, we found that it, uh, the color inverted condition. So making the tongue look blue rather than red actually <clears throat> did reduce uh, pain in patients. All right, so let's talk about some of the tips uh, that I have for you. Now, the first one here is to examine carefully because as you already know, there are so many things that can be picked up in the mouth and you, it's difficult to refer the patient, for example, for investigation of oral potentially pre-malignant condition if, if you missed this lesion in the first place. Now, if you do find something, definitely record it with good detail on, uh, you know, the measurements, the shape, the texture, the borders. So on the photograph there on the right-hand side of the top, you can see that I've used the periodontal probe uh, to take the photograph. So it will be obvious what, what the scale of the, of, of the um, white plaque is. Now, a picture is worth a thousand words. I do recommend photographing. For me, every patient is photographed multiple times. Um, if you are thinking about uh, going to dental school or when you've graduated from dental school, think about investing in a good camera. It will definitely be worthwhile. Um, the other things that you can consider is, as, as well are loops and headlights. Although I think if I had, if I only had a certain amount of money to spend and I could only buy one thing, uh, for me, it will be hands down a, a good clinical camera because they do form part of your medical records. They are useful if you're referring the patient on, you can send a photograph with it. And also if you're bringing back the patient in two weeks, to review if the lesion has disappeared or has resolved or not, um, you really need a clinical photograph so you can see what it looked like at the start. So saving money, investing in a good clinical camera. Now you can learn some of these lesion descriptors. And again, you can pause the video here or it is freely available um, on, on some of my sites, but lesion descriptors are universal. It helps you describe the lesion in your notes and when you're communicating and when you're communicating with others, it does look more professional as well. So sometimes uh, you may hear people start to talk about vesica or bulla or papule or nodules and you may be wondering what the actual difference is. Well, I've uh, put it here on these uh, graphics for you. <clears throat> Now, there is a useful mnemonic as well, uh, which I came up with, although there are a hundred different ways to do this. And I think as long as you cover most of it, you should be fine. You can come up with your own as well. But when you're describing a lesion, um, it is important, or when you're investigating or examining a lesion, it's also important not to miss things about it. So you will want to know where it is, what, how big it is, um, the color of it, uh, the consistency of it, um, the shape, borders, texture, surface contour, whether it drains, whether it blanches, whether it moves. So I think if you have a useful mnemonic like that, when you say, for example, you find something and you're like, oh, okay, um, how do I record, how do I think about this? How do I look at this? And how do I write it in my notes? Um, you know, having a mnemonic and knowing the correct terminology, I think will go a long way. Now we're almost at the end of my presentation here, but these are images from my patients and they are all oral tongue squamous cell carcinomas. Now, as you can see, the one there on the bottom right is very subtle. You might actually find it a little bit difficult to see. It may not look particularly worrying, but it was oral squamous cell carcinoma. So it is important as well to train yourself not to dismiss the subtle. Uh, sometimes there can be a tendency to downplay things, but again, if in doubt, check it out. So the keys to a thorough examination, if you don't look, you don't find. The very first step is actually knowing how to perform a good intraoral and extraoral examination. Um, you want to be really good at recording your findings if you do find anything unusual. No such thing as a silly referral, so you get it checked out because you can save your patient's life or signif significantly improve their quality of life if they do unfortunately have a, have a malignant or pre-malignant condition. Now I do uh, have, I, I do, I, there was a series of videos that I recorded last year with a few of my American colleagues. Um, this is Professor Andres Pinto. He's the current head of the American Academy of Oral Medicine, Professor Rosca and Dr. Ojeda. Um, you can check these out on my YouTube sites or you can actually um, check out the American Academy of Oral Medicine or the European Association of Oral Medicine as well. There are many good oral medicine specialists worldwide and I, I, I feel like I'm very lucky to know uh, excellent colleagues so definitely do give them a check out especially if oral medicine has caught your interest 
So these are some of my final thoughts. Now, this, these are my final thoughts about dentistry in general. Um, dentistry is a team sport. So surround yourself with a good team there. Um, I, you can see my friends there on the uh, left-hand side. Um, the one at the top is uh, a group of specialists or, you know, dentists that, that I just regularly talk to or hang out with. Um, it's important to get support when you do need it. Good mentors are worth their weight in gold. Uh, get involved with local or international groups. That's personally something that I've done and found very re rewarding. Besides dentistry and work life and study, uh, life is not all about that as well. So find some of the things that bring you joy. Um, on the left-hand side there, you can see me with my two West Highland Terrier dogs, and they obviously bring me a lot of joy. Um, overarching tenants, treat your patients as you would your own family. I think it's difficult to go wrong if you um, do that consistently, uh, or at least you know, you, you, you're really doing the best you can, and never stop learning. So I've got some of the photographs there from the World Workshop of Oral Medicine, and that's a lot of the oral medicine specialists worldwide. Um, so I, I, yeah, so I would recommend just reaching out to oral medicine specialists in your area if you are interested in this topic. All right, thank you. Are there any questions? First of all, that was incredible. Um, personally, I learned so much. This is very different than anything, um, any of the other specialties we've looked at. So thank you so, so much. Um, we do have questions from our Instagram and YouTube. Um, okay, we'll start with YouTube. Okay, this is a mouthful, but let's see. Okay, so do you see patients who exhibit psychosomatic symptoms of trauma in the oral cavity? For example, extended freeze response from depression resulting in perpetually sore throat. Yeah, short, short answer. Yes. Yeah. So you know how I, I gave you that example before of, of the girl who came in with oral facial pain, history of sexual abuse. I mean, there are, um, there are manifestations of chronic pain um, that can be seen in the, in the oral cavity. And, uh, you know, there's a process that's called central sensitization uh, where, where patients that are in pain, basically their brain are programmed to feel more pain. Um, psychosocial factors can perpetuate these sort of conditions as well. So it, 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 it's, it's a big topic, but in short, uh, in short, yes. Okay, awesome. And that's why it's so important to look at the patient's psychosocial history and be comfortable talking to them about it. Gotcha. Um, okay, so to kind of go with that, um, what type of oral facial pain would you see in someone who has a long history of abuse, um, long history of being verbally abused by family? So I guess just an example of what you have seen or what some other things you would have seen. Oh, uh, it's very, it's very broad. I mean, it's difficult, like myofascial pain syndrome, for example, you can see temporary mandibular joint disorders, masticatory myalgia. Um, oral burning, um, patients with fibromyalgia. Um, yeah, the, it's, it's broad. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, in the beginning, you said that you were um, in the Navy for a, a brief uh, amount of time. So what was that experience like? How was it different? Or what was your daily life like then? Yeah, so I joined the Navy um, as an undergraduate. Uh, so they co-sponsored so they paid a little bit towards my last year I think of dental school um, in return when I finished I, I worked for them so the first six months this is in Australia obviously it's different mm -hmm. yeah. wherever you are but in Australia the first six months was officer training where I only did military uh, work and no dentistry at all so I did military training during that time uh, afterwards uh, I worked as a dentist on base uh, on on land and I worked as a dentist. So basically, I would see patients for general dentistry. Um, it, it was good. I really liked it. The Australian Navy, in particular, very supportive with training dentists. I had access to a lot of uh, continuing professional development that was covered by the Navy. When I was studying, the Navy covered uh, a lot of my textbooks. Um, I think working for a dentist there, ooh, I, I enjoyed it. Um, I have a lot of friends who are still currently dentists in the Navy. Mm. Uh, for me, it was just more uh, personal life and my uh, medical conditions that, that made it uh, hard for me to stay. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I would recommend checking it out if you're interested. Um, I think there are definitely a, a lot of uh, advantages to doing that. Okay, um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, so... You went through a lot of different schooling, a lot of different experiences. So how would you say your study habits change or how did you find yourself motivated to keep going or to keep, keep educating, keep learning? Um, so what were your 
kind of tips for that? This is this is not great, but I won't <laughs> lie. Um, as a dental student, was I the most hardworking student? Um, not not really. I suppose the the point there that I would like to make uh, for everyone is that don't feel disheartened if you, for example, are a late bloomer or sometimes if you find it difficult to get motivated. I mean, obviously you want to pass dental school, but don't beat yourself up if you are not the one that's studying hardest every every single day. Because for me, it took me a while. So when I got into dental school uh, at the University of Melbourne, I just finished year 12, uh, as as had everyone else. Um, And to be honest, by that stage, I was just, uh, year year 12 is... um, is that is that the same in the US? Anyway, I just finished high school and I had to study quite hard for my uh, examinations at that point. And I think I was just over it. <laughs> so during dental school, I was not the uh, hardest working. Um, I, I didn't, like, I wasn't particularly motivated. Um, obviously, you have to do enough to pass. And I think it's always good if you are you know, as good a student as you can be, but just because you may not be studying 100% all the time, that doesn't, that doesn't impact anything. Um, Study smart as well. Um, No point rote learning everything if you don't actually understand it. Uh, For me, particularly, uh, for, for me, just my own personal experience that I really started studying a lot and becoming interested in a lot of this when I found a topic that I did find really interesting, like oral medicine. And I, think that when you are passionate about something or when you or when it all comes together in your head for example that makes it a lot easier for you to study so during dental school I actually found oral medicine quite tricky because there was a lot to me uh, at that stage there was a lot of rote learning for oral medicine because I didn't really understand the content it was only afterwards when I started to become interested and learn more about it that all the pieces started to fall together a little bit Uh, when I started seeing patients with these certain conditions I would learn more about it read up about uh, read up on it so um I'm not I'm not the most amazing uh studier but I think don't worry too much if you are not just do the best you can um it is normal for motivation to come in waves as well um consistency is key if you're trying to get through dental school but don't feel like you have to be at 100 percent all the time because that's an easy way to burn out as well yeah of course thank you thank you so much um, for everything, the presentation, all of the uh, question and answer session. Um, so thank you everyone for watching. Um, yeah. Great. All right. Well, thank you very much. Oh, sorry. I think I've got another couple of slides here if anybody did want to get hold of me afterwards. Um, I, I'm on Facebook and Instagram and I do have some videos there on YouTube, as you know. And finally, thank you so much for Fresh Dental Shadowing for having me here. Of course. All right. Thank you. Uh, 